Hello and welcome back to our series, Turning Your Winter Blues into Winter Greens. Whether you've never grown food before or you only have grown herbs in containers but not in the winter, this is the place to be. What we're doing with this three-part series workshop is we're teaching you how to grow food in the winter. So we're gonna be covering, as we just did in that first video, what you can grow in the winter. This is the second video, and in this video, we're gonna cover how do you grow successfully in the winter and how do you protect the seedlings? What are the tools and techniques? So we're gonna be going into grow lights and some other interesting um, things you've probably heard, cold frame, greenhouses, things like that. And then we're gonna finish up the series with what I think is the most exciting part, which is once you're growing all this food, what do you do with the unique recipes and sauces and teas that you can do with this nutritious food so that you are really reaping the benefits of all the nutrition that's in those leafy greens and herbs that you're growing. So I'm Christy Ross and I'm the founder of Planted Places and at Planted Places we teach people how to grow food year round through our Planted Box and Planted Wall memberships and we do that so that you can be maintaining your optimal health year round and what's really cool about what we do is we weave that food that you're growing into what we call the Planted Life series and we introduce you to um, chefs, gourmet chefs, medicinal, nutritionalists, people that really know a lot about what they're talking about, that really provide that extra, um, like I like to say, that extra mile when it comes to your health. So it's not just, it's great to be growing the food, but then, you know, how do you actually use that in creative ways so that you're benefiting all the time? So if you did not see our first series um, on the what to grow during the winter, you wanna make sure it's on the same page um, where this video was, you wanna go back and you wanna make sure to watch that because I do talk about specifically what leafy greens are you growing this time of year. I talk about microgreens, I talk about mushrooms and potatoes, different things that you can be doing in cooler weather. And I do talk about the nutrition as well. And there's also a PDF download for you where we highlight some of the, the big ones and we talk about the nutrients in there and we talk about how you can prepare those. But I will say that the, the, big, um, the big two, I, I kind of highlighted two big plants that you can grow in the winter and that was arugula and bok choy. And those things are like superfoods. I don't even know if they're officially called superfoods, but they've got 11 different vitamins and nutrients. And I talk about that in the video as well. So in this video, I'm gonna go a little deeper now in terms of actually how you grow food and, um, and specifically how you do it in winter. I wanna thank everybody that is providing um, comments or actually um, filling out the surveys and providing some, um, some of the questions, different answers you're looking for because that's really helping me make this um, as customized as possible. And one of the things that people are asking, which um, we're definitely gonna cover is, when it's winter, how do I protect my plants? And also people are asking about grow lights. So we're gonna go into all of that. So first off where I wanna start is I wanna start with the most important, which is your growing medium and what you're using. And so soil is super important. And that is one thing we do at, at Planted Places is we are teaching you how to grow food in living soil. And we produce our memberships um, each month. You get a box of seedlings and planting projects um, that you're either growing on a wall or in grow pots, and you're also getting soil. Um, and the soil is so important. I'm gonna go into detail on that right now. Um, and the reason for that is, it, this is organic, obviously. Everything that we do is organic. And I don't wanna say obviously, but sometimes people just assume that, and you can't always assume that unless it's stated it's organic. Um, we source our seedlings only from certified organic growers, and then we also, the soil we're using is 100% organic. And um, let me talk a little bit about living soil. So living soil, you know, it's called living soil because basically it allows something to live in it. <laughs> so most dirt that you see in a, in a garden bed is, is dead. So unless you're adding organic um, components, materials, compost into there, it's kind of dead soil. And so that's super important when you're growing food because if you're putting malnutritioned kind of soil and that's growing your, your leafy greens and your herbs, then that means that's what that plant is taking up, which means less nutrients in the leafy green. And so there's also, um, and we're gonna put it on the same page, we have a blog where we talk about nutrient depletion. And that's important because that blog specifically talks about once you harvest um, a plant and it starts traveling 
to the grocery store or the farmer's market, it immediately, it just starts losing its nutritional value. It's another huge advantage of growing food because it stays longer, it stays fresher because it's obviously growing with the roots intact. And then once you harvest that, it's you're eating the nutrition right off the, off the vine, so to speak. Um, I also noticed that when I harvest an entire leaf, um, you know, kind of head of lettuce because it's, it's bolted and it needs to come out, um, you know, I wash that with cold water, I protect that with paper towels, I put that in my refrigerator, and that lasts way longer than if I were to buy leafy greens at the farmer's market. So that's just kind of another truth and testament of kind of growing in leafy and living soil and it being fresh is so important. But let's talk a little bit about kind of what is, what's going on in living soil. So really a lot of it is microbial activity. You don't even see it, you don't even know what's going on. And so when you put organic um, fertilizers and you know, and, component and material into the soil, believe it or not, the roots of that plant actually can't take up that. It's not in a form the plant can, the roups can um, digest and, or I should, you know, up, uptake. And so it's the microbial activity. So it's literally like the worms, the fungi, the bacteria, good and bad, all this microbial activity that's in the soil that's actually breaking down that organic fertilizers, that organic material, it's decomposing that material and it's converting it into a form that the root plants can take up. So that is why when people say things like worm castings, those kinds of words, those are, that actually is good. <laughs> um, that actually means that there's probably worms in that soil that's actually breaking down that soil for you and decomposing that organic matter so the, the plants can take up the actual, the nutrients that are there. So healthy soil means healthy plants very important. So the soil that we're using is is great stuff. I like to call it kind of like black gold because it's got a lot of great ingredients in there that really make that soil healthy. Because remember, the more dense that nutrition is and dense those um, kind of macro and micronutrients are that the plants need, the healthier that plant's going to be. So it's very important. So, um, so we talk about the soil, but then I also want to talk about the fertilizers because that's important too. Because when you're planting and you're um, growing in, um, in containers like this, so we use these same containers actually, they go into our wall structure as well. So when you're growing in something like this, it is smaller than a raised bed. So it's really important that you are packing in the nutrients. And so our soil has something called biochar in it. And biochar, is a fossilized kind of charcoal, lasts for thousands of years. And what biochar does is it has a super high surface area. So um, they say the surface area, don't quote me on this, but I've, I've heard this and read this, that the surface area of a kind of a, a square foot of biochar equals the same surface area of, as a football field. I find that hard to believe, but I do know from its performance that it does wonderful things for the plants. And so what does it mean to have a high surface area in the soil? What that basically means is all that microbial activity that's going on, it's kind of amplified because it is taking this space that's here and it's making it like tenfold, thousandfold. So there's much more microbial activity going on. It also provides air pockets for the roots to breathe and to grow, which is very important. Whenever you have a really densely packed soil, it's not good for the plants because there's not a lot of air and movement for the roots and for the microbial activity to take place. So that's important. It also has worm castings in it. So what is worm castings? Worm castings is dead earthworm poop. <laughs> and um, they say that in worm castings, it has 60 of the essential macro and micronutrients that a plant needs. So that's crazy. So you want worm castings in your soil whenever you can. The macronutrients that a plant eats is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And nitrogen is by far usually the biggest um, macronutrient that's needed. And there are things that help increase the nitrogen uptake by the plants. Calcium is one such example. So let's talk fertilizers real quick. When um, with our customers, we will not only provide the soil, but we also provide a mix, a proprietary mix blend of organic fertilizers. And oftentimes we're using marine-based fertilizers because those are the healthiest and most eco-friendly. And oyster shells is a good example of a marine-based um, fertilizer that actually has a lot of calcium in it. And the calcium is good for the plant cells, but it also helps the plant uptake nitrogen easily. 
So that's important because the nitrogen, those are those micronutrients sit in the soil and the calcium's helping that uptake. So I could nerd out on this all day long because I think it's fascinating. Little tidbit about me, I study molecular biology in undergrad. Um, I didn't do that, I went on into business and got my MBA, but I did geek out on biology when I was an undergrad and I love this stuff. So I'm just so excited to be back um, learning about this and, um, and actually reaping the benefits for my own personal health and yours. That's why I'm bringing it to you guys. Okay, so that kind of talks about soil and the importance of that and what we're doing with that. And um, the other thing, um, let me show you about this with this kale. So when you are planting seedlings, um, it's important that you are supporting the root stem. So you can see kale in particular has a really high kind of stem and it's like that because it needs to be strong to support the big leaves because kale really produces some pretty big leaves. These are just growing in. They're actually not as big as they're gonna be, but they're gonna get even bigger. <laughs> this is a pretty new plant. And so um, so when you, when you plant it, you wanna really plant it deep into the soil. So what we do with our customers, we give them the proprietary soil with the fertilizers. We mix that in to the soil so you're just getting that extra boost. That's also gonna help the roots when it, that seedling first comes in. It's gonna help those roots get established quicker. And that's important because the first thing that happens when you plant a seedling is it, you don't see a lot of activity on the outside because the roots are just making their home, right? They're, they're in there and they're waiting for that microbial activity to start taking place so that they can start uptaking all those nutrition and start growing. And so that's one reason why we also add the fertilizer mix into the soil so that that activity kind of jump starts and happens faster. Okay, so next thing we're gonna turn to is we're gonna start talking about what does it mean for winter? This first series, first part was important in terms of what understanding what you're growing in, because it's the most important thing you can do. Um, the second thing is in the winter, you have to be make sure that you're protecting your plants. So we talked about what you should be growing, what plants can take the cooler temperatures, but depending on where you live, it's gonna make a difference in terms of mild, moderate, and extreme. And so I wanna talk about those. So I'm gonna talk a little bit right now, and then I'm gonna show you some actual pictures of what these these things look like. Because if you're like me and you're new to this, or I'm not new anymore, but I was new to this, um, I didn't know what these things were. <laughs> I knew what some of them were, but I didn't know the detail about it. So um, let's talk mild environments first. So that, you know, I, I live in Northern California and that's where we're headquartered. And you can consider Northern California probably a mild environment. Um, you know, Southern California, um, Arizona, Texas, Florida, all of these states um, kind of mild to, you know, neutral. <laughs> you know, they're, they're pretty warm in the, in the winter. But I will say with places like, um, you know, Arizona and te Texas, places like that, I mean, they get the extremes and that's what you need to worry about. You might have nice, sunny, warm days, but your nighttime temperatures get very cold. And so um, what you wanna be doing for the mild environment is if you live somewhere where it is dipping into the high 30s, um, you're okay. Like you're okay, what you should do is in general, you kind of want to maybe group those, con if you're container growing, you want to kind of group those plants together. They kind of create a micro environment. What I do here, as you can see, there's an arbor above me. I put my plants kind of all together um, underneath here. So this, this arbor is protecting it. Of course, these are grape leaves and that is gonna, you know, they're gonna go away. <laughs> Very soon they're falling off already because of winter, but um, they're still going to be a little bit more protected because they're kind of in a corner of the yard. If it was out in the middle of the yard, um, it'd be way more exposed. And so if you're dropping into the low 30s consistently, but the nighttime, the daytime te temperatures are nice, what I would suggest is just get a drop cloth. You can actually use a sheet, but if you go to your local nursery or hardware store, they will have frost cloths, shade cloths, and you can just drip that over the containers or even over the wall if you've got the planted wall or you're growing vertically you just drape it over that or your garden bed and it will protect those at night but then during the day you want to take that off because if it's warming up you want the the heat and you want the sunlight you want that direct sunlight so you don't want to keep them covered during the day so that's again if you're in a mild a mild temperature it's tricky because it's warm during the day but it's really cold at night so you have to be careful the nighttime um, the next thing would be if you're in a moderate environment. So if you're in a moderate environment, which basically I'd like to call that, um, you know, you're, it, it dips into freezing temperatures quite frequently, but during the day you're kind of maybe above freezing temperatures. Um, those, you're gonna probably wanna start using a, a portable greenhouse. 
um, or a cold frame. But um, greenhouses can be really inexpensive. You can buy one, you know, a portable one that is like, you know, six feet by six feet and, you know, kind of five feet tall for like $40 on Amazon. So they're not, they're not that expensive. And they provide enough protection in um, some of these more moderate climate and winters that you probably would be okay. Um, if you're getting excessively cold nights, you can actually even bring a heater, kind of a, a camping heater into that greenhouse as well to, to warm it up a little bit at nighttime. So you can do things like that. Um, people that are in extreme, um, you know, like you live in Tahoe, you live in Boston and, and it's covered with snow or Flagstaff, Arizona covered in snow. You're going to want to bring those inside for the winter months and you're going to want to grow with grow lights. And so um, this is important to know that you cannot expect to be um, just have a, just a bright window shining on those plants, they won't thrive. But in general, if you're growing food, um, you know, vegetative growth that you're, you know, food you're eating, they need the direct sunlight, but they're not all created equal. And I'm going to show you um, specifically what you need to be looking for because they have grow lights that grow for indoor plants. Um, you know, those are your, your philodendron and your spider plants and monstera, those kinds of plants. Those do not need the same kind of color temperature or wavelength um, that the vegetative leafy greens need. And that's important to know because if you buy the wrong kind of grow light, they won't thrive. And it's also important to know the range of light as well because you want to make sure you get enough coverage on all your greens. So let's switch over to those slides and let me talk, let me show you some pictures of what these things look like and show you some of the resources. So these are some pictures of what typical, just really portable greenhouses and cold frames are, which is really what we're presenting here. Um, knowing that we are gardening with containers, small containers um, and pots, we're not talking raised bed type of situations here. Really what you can be doing is um, searching online and these things you can see they're very affordable. So. Um, if you're, again, dealing with temperatures where you're not really having very harsh climates, um, it's dipping below freezing, you can put it within a, um, a cold frame or a greenhouse and you can keep it, um, you know, at least 5 to 10 degrees warmer in that environment. Um, if you have a portable greenhouse like the one here on the left, oftentimes you can put a drop sheet over that, over the greenhouse as well to, to add some extra insulation. Um, but the big thing here is the greenhouse is going to get much more light exposure during the day. The cold frame, it does have because it's got that window on top, but you're, you're sort of limited and um, it's they're protecting when they're really young seedlings. But um, again, there it's also kind of assuming that you have the space for that. So those are those options. And then the next thing I want to show you is our um, grow lights. So when it comes to grow lights, what you need to realize is that there's a lot of factors and variables that come into growing indoors because this is really about go, coming indoors instead of growing outdoors. And so it's not just about the grow lights, but it's about the temper vari temperature variations that you have going on in that room, air ventilation, and then of course watering is always, always important. So if, and you know, things do tend to dry out faster. Um, if they have air draft and things going on inside, so you need to be a care, you need to be aware of that. So specifically with grow lights, um, you know you can see there's a there's typically there's fluorescent, there's LED, and there's HID. And um, what you want to be focusing on is um, LED lights. Those are truly the most efficient grow lights that are out there now. They've come a really long way, and they used to be more expensive. They are more expensive than fluorescent, but they last much longer and they're much more energy efficient. So highly recommend those. Um, and then there's really two parameters that you're looking for in grow lights. It's the wavelength spectrum, which is your um, color spectrum, which we'll talk about. And then there's a par value. And those are really two very important components when it comes to grow lights. And what you'll find, especially if you're searching online, you'll find a lot of the um, companies and the manufacturers will be talking about color spectrum, wavelength numbers, but they will not be talking about par value. You also often see it called PPFD. Um, and that's an important factor. Um, let me talk first about the color spectrum. So plants can only use visible light for photosynthesis. So you were really just looking at the visible light spectrum and green leafy edible plants use primarily the blue spectrum of the wavelength there 
and then flowering plants like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, and such, those use the red spectrum. But always to be safe, what you want to do is you want to go with a full light color spectrum. Um, because even the green leafies, they do need a little bit of the red. So it's best if you have both of a full color spectrum. Not only is it more pleasing to the eye because it's just a white light, it's not these kind of obnoxious purple lights or blue lights that you, you tend to see um, in grow houses, but this is a full light spectrum, color spectrum, so it's going to be a white light, and it's going to give you all the wavelengths that you need for growing your food indoors. Now, the second parameter is going to be that PAR value. The PAR value is actually the amount of light that's usable to the plant. So that's kind of the simplest way of stating it. The important number that you want to know is you want to have a PAR value that is close to 200. Um, if you're doing fruiting plants, it wants to be closer to 500. Now, typically with how you, when you're growing with the seasons, you're not going to be doing fruiting plants indoors. Those are going to be outdoors because it's going to be summertime when you're growing tomatoes and peppers and you're going to, you're not going to be dealing with snow and things like in harsh temperatures. So really for indoor in the winter, you want to get a PAR value that's close to 200. And you will find when you search online that you get what you pay for. So if you're looking and you find a light on Amazon and it's really inexpensive, chances are it's either not going to cover a very large surface area or it's not really a high enough par value um, to really help those plants thrive. So 200 is ideal as long as you're getting kind of close to 100 or 150 you should be doing okay but you really don't want to be getting something that has a par value around 30 because it's not going to do much for you um, so again just to summarize wavelength is important you want to have a full light color spectrum you want to have an led light you want to have a par value and you want to, the higher the better as close to 200 as you can get and when you have these grow lights you want to have them running about 12 to 14 hours a day because one grow light hour does not equal one sunlight hour. Um, so you want to make sure that you are have the plants in the part of your house or in the garage where you can actually have that light on for about 12 hours a day. People will ask, how close should you have that light to the plants? And um, I always recommend you want to use a rectangular array for the coverage, You so you know, kind of like a tube. LED lights don't come as tubes, that's what a fluorescent light is, but they definitely have re rectangular tube-like structures that have LED lights in them. And that's because you're gonna have a more even display of light. And typically you're gonna hang that about one to two feet, three feet above the seedlings. And when you hang that, you know, when they're young, you're going to want to be able to kind of raise that light as they get larger. So hopefully that um, that's helpful and that gives you the information you need for grow lights. It can get pretty techy, but again, just remember cool um, full light color spectrum and you want to have a par value close to 200. Um, I left this website address here because this actually shows you the top 25 best LED grow lights on the market. These are pricey but you can find some that are a couple hundred dollars um, and that is really gonna be the best situation for growing, growing edible food indoors. Um, the last thing I could say is having it next to a window with direct sunlight will not be that successful. So just know that and it's worth the investment if you're really serious about trying to grow food and grow a lot of food indoors, you need to make, make the investment. Okay. We have covered a lot in this video. Um, we talked a lot about soil and all of the biology going on beneath the surface. We talked about fertilizers. We talked about most, what do you do to protect your plants? Um, and we talked about grow lights and specifics that you want to look like, the specifications and requirements for that. So, One of the things I did want to say too is, you know, as, you know I talked to a lot of people about this, um, you know, kind of growing food, especially as we bring more and more members on. And what I find so interesting is when people first get started, you know, they're very intimidated. They've, um, a lot of people have tried it before and they have not been successful. And that's one reason why um, I love what we're doing because it is, there's a coaching process that kind of walks you through because there's so many questions you have at first. And actually always, <laughs> there's always something going on. And, um, and the big thing I can say is patience. You know, like when you first grow those plants and they get in that soil, they are getting acclimated and that's a good thing. And then once they start growing, 
you're gonna start seeing a lot of activity and then you can start harvesting and then you can start doing all of the great things that you do with the food. And in the winter, there's some great things you can be doing in terms of warm salads, soups, teas, um, infused oils and vinegars. There's so much you can be doing with all. This next video, the final video, we are gonna talk about what you can do with some of the food that you're growing. And um, I'm really excited because I'm gonna have Robin Rigsby, who is, she calls herself the Happy Food Chef, and we are partnering with her to bring all of her knowledge to you. She is a medicinal nutritionist, um, health coach. She's been a raw food chef um, for a top restaurant in Naples, Florida for many years. And she brings all that knowledge about plant-based cooking and food to us. And so she, we're lucky enough that she's put together just a, a quick 10, 15 minute video for us to see a recipe, watch walk through recipe. And more importantly, she's gonna share the tidbits of kind of what can you do with a lot of these winter greens to really make sure you're you're maintaining the nutrition in those in those greens and those herbs and really boosting your immunity. If you have any more questions, please leave those for me. I'm happy to answer them. I'm happy to cover them in the next video too, if I can. Um, another great thing that we're gonna talk about is, you know, I've taught you a lot about kind of the soil and, and you know, how to protect things in the winter, but really this is something you should be doing year round. And um, it's, if you can handle it in the winter, then the rest of the year is pretty darn easy. But um, one thing I wanna talk about in the next video as well is like, how do you do this year round and how do we make it so easy for you? Because so much of it is finding the right curated seedlings that we pull together from our organic growers. And I wanna talk about that and all these projects you can be doing with food year round and how different times of the year you do different things. And it's just, it's really exciting to learn to grow through the seasons because food tastes better and is healthier when you're eating it at its peak when it's supposed to be growing. So thanks you so much for joining. And again, please give me your comments, your questions. If there's anything that I'm not answering in these, please let me know so I can make sure to cover them in our final video.